So it is five minutes past four, five minutes past 10 CET. So let me start the ball rolling. Um, again, um, in case you've joined a bit later, uh, in case you want to have any other questions answered, it goes beyond this little article or this little webinar that I'm going to give today. Please always feel free to uh, literally drop me an email. Connect with me on, on LinkedIn. Uh, catch me whenever you can. Um, otherwise, I uh, want to get the ball rolling today. Um, just to give you a, a two or three minutes about, about Galen Growth, in case you're joining us for the very first time. Um, we, are an, we are a six-year-old company. We're turning six very soon. Um, a company that is uh, headquartered in Singapore with a satellite office based in Switzerland and Basel. So Sarah is located at the moment as, as well. Um, we are literally here to help companies unleash their digital health in innovations by helping them with any sort of strategic advisory work or enabling them to also understand the more complex markets. And I can go into one of the indicators um, that we have designed in order to help companies later on in this report as, as well. Um, we are using um, our own um, our own venture database, which is called Health Tech Alpha, which is at the moment, uh, which is still at the moment, um, a very B two B centric solution where we are now tracking more than seven seven thousand four hundred. Now we've actually crossed the seven and a half thousand mark of digital health ventures in that space. The total entities uh, within the database are now exceeding more than twenty five thousand um, companies that are active within the digital health space. Um, what we are particularly doing is we are basically covering the entire globe when, when it comes to digital health you know, innovations, um, and we are serving our clients out of our offices in, in, in Asia, um, both in Tokyo and in Singapore, as well out of Switzerland. Um, we are a very dedicated team uh, with tons of years of experience within that space, um, innovators ourselves or investors within that space, people who worked in the, in the industry, and we basically are here to, to, to help you to tailor any sort of innovative solutions around the digital health ecosystem for you. Um, so today, I'm going to give you a bit of a run through um, our latest report, which uh, covers the digital health ecosystem across China. China is yet or still the largest market for digital health innovations across Asia Pacific and is still the largest and is still the second largest market across the globe after the U United States, if you can um, imagine that. Um, and so I'm going to give you a bit of an overview how mature the ecosystem is. And I also try to target a bit what might also have some negative impact now based on the latest um, new implementations of the privacy issues and of the uh, of the tech track crackdown by the Chinese government on the ecosystem overall, and whether this might have any negative impact also on the, on the ecosystem overall. So um, looking into the funding overall, um, China has always been um, the powerhouse of, um, of funding for Asia Pacific. Um, when you see here the numbers that are next to the little orange bar for, for Asia Pacific, um, funding has always been beyond the 60% share of the total funding that has been invested across Asia Pacific. Um, in 2020, this actually spiked um, to um, 79%, so to $5.3 billion totally invested. Um, this had a huge, um, the, like the reason behind this was the funding in 2019 has dropped significantly as compared to the previous years. Um, this was because of the US, um, of the US Sino trade war that was happening. And then later COVID kicking in. Um, and now during Q2, Q, uh, Q3, Q4 of, of 2020, all of the funding that has been that has not been invested, let's say between the third and fourth quarter of 2019 and first and second quarter of 2020, because both of the of the of the Sino uh, US trade war and later the COVID-19 pan pandemic has now been heavily invested um, during the third and fourth quarter of, of 2020. When China kind of went out of their um, Kind of went out of their bubble and started actually opening up at least their own regional market within, um, and therefore um, also the investments um, actually started very very strong. Twenty twenty one has been again a bit a bit weird so so far. When we are looking into into the share of how much China is is, is actually covering from the um, from the funding share, this is actually on par to what we saw in in twenty nineteen overall. There might be different. Um, reasons behind this. One could be the current crackdown on the tech 
um, on the tech companies, especially the new tech companies that we are seeing out there, that again, investors are becoming a bit more risk averse and are trying to bring their money into more um, into 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 older um, into older technologies that are not so much tech and and able. It's still very early to say that because um, the impact has only been felt recently, also, and it only became public recently that there is the crackdown on on, on tech companies, starting with Arn Financials and now moving over to all of the other big big companies there. Um, but traditionally, we are seeing in funding decrease. We are seeing these these events happening two or three months earlier to when actually things are getting public. For instance, in 2019, we saw that something was happening um, before actually the Sino uh, US trade war was, was actually announced out there. So it's actually a quite a nice indicator to see that there is something wrong with a particular industry that we are looking into, and especially when we look into funding trends overall. When we look into the funding overall um, across China and actually seeing why this is such a powerhouse, when, when you're looking here particularly into the global top five cities, Beijing is the second most invested um, city in the world. Uh, it's the third most invested city in the world. And when you look into, into Asia Pacific, it's the most invested city um, across Asia Pacific, coming straight after New York and San Francisco and even um, above Boston which is quite surprising because we're usually saying that digital health innovation comes very often out of Boston. Um, the, the reason why New York stays here very far atop is particularly driven by the fact that most investors have their head offices there. And hence you also see many digital health innovations happening there. And then followed by San Francisco, which is because of the Silicon Valley hype. Um, so we have many ventures also at the, um, at the West Coast of, of, of the States. When we look into the top cities across China, um, we have actually Beijing followed by Guangzhou, uh, Shenzhen, Shanghai, and Hangzhou. Uh, and then you have a couple of smaller cities that are more around the satellites of, of either Shanghai here, or you even have here this, this, this Guangzhou Shenzhen cluster, which together forms actually quite a huge ecosystem that, uh, that surpasses the total invested uh, funding across Beijing overall. Often Shenzhen and Guangzhou are being seen as Kind of belonging together. It's a very vibrant city there in, in, in the south, just north of Hong Kong. And therefore, these two cities are often the hub for innovation across um, China as well, versus Beijing, which stands more for the traditional, uh, for the traditional ecosystem, a very mature, a very mature city that has lots of innovators living there as well. Um, what I was referring in, in the beginning, um, we are supporting our clients very heavily on finding the right fit, um, not just when it comes to ventures within a particular market, but also which markets they should actually enter with a certain product. Um, let's assume you are uh, a multinational insurance company and you're looking into, um, into new markets where you would like to launch a certain product, but you're not quite sure yet how you actually should do that. Um, and you first need, need to figure out in which markets do I actually want to launch them. So what we can do, we, we look into a series of macroeconomic and microeconomic factors and are creating a certain score out of it, which we are calling the Digital Health Readiness Index, um, which looks into a series of different indices um, and then compares ecosystems on a like-for-like -like comparison and is, and is basically telling you, is this country that you'd like to enter now a very mature market? Is it a very immature market when I, when I look only into certain factors? So looking into all of the factors overall and here taking four countries as an example, for instance, you can always cluster them um, according to, is the country ready for digital health? Is the economy is the macroeconomically slow, but the micro ecosystem, so the venture ecosystem, so the innovators um, within the market are actually quite strong. Is the country just not ready? There are no ventures out there and the economy is not strong enough to, to support um, a current launch of a, of, a, of a particular product. Or is actually the economy very, very ready, but we just don't see enough um, innovators within the market overall at the moment. This is, those are the four clusters where we can put any country across the globe on at the moment. So when we look into China and we are comparing them across Australia, South Korea, and Japan, when it comes to the microeconomic scoring, they're actually, um, they're, they're very far on the right-hand side. We have almost 700, uh, we have more than 700 digital health um, startups within the market, lots of publications, lots of new solutions that, that are getting launched um, every year. 
and therefore this is a pretty strong ecosystem from a macroeconomic point of view. Macroeconomic now now looks into how are also how's the policy behind it? Are there any any regulations that um, that that are having an, an impact? This particular chart here was made prior to the tech crackdown kicking in, which put which could potentially have also negative impact on the development of, of China as an ecosystem overall. But if you compare this to South Korea and Japan, for instance, that have um, traditionally always been a bit slower when it comes to the implementation of certain regulations around digital health, let's say South Korea only announced that they're opening the ecosystem up for telemedicine implementations earlier this year. Japan has been even slower in, in, in terms of implementing anything. Still, you can't send uh, medication to your doorstep, for instance. That's still not allowed in, in Japan. And therefore, from a macroeconomic point of view, um, these countries are not as outstanding as, as they are. Australia, on the other side, has a very strong support from a governmental point of view. For instance, they've recently launched, again, to, together with Antelth, a new fund to invest into early stage ventures. These are, these are all governmental or policy or regulatory changes that are having a very strong impact on the macroeconomic score of it. So if we are looking into it, um, we can actually cluster China in the, the country is very ready and there's a very strong microeconomic support as well. So in the upper right corner, Australia is very strong from a regulatory point of view and from a macroeconomic point of view, but we just don't see enough ventures there or not enough um, late stage ventures that are supporting um, the ecosystem that we are seeing. South Korea and Japan are very much in the center. There are still need to be some, um, some, some changes happening both on a macroeconomic point of view as well from a microeconomic support in, in order to move them also to the, to the upper right corner to basically say this is a very ready country to now launch a new solution there. It doesn't mean that you should not launch in these countries. It just might have a more negative impact or it might be harder for you to launch a new product within these markets with the support of a digital health venture overall. Looking into some of the factors um, for the macroeconomic side here, for instance, internet hospitals, it's a very strong supporting factor when it comes to, to, um, to, uh, to China. It's probably the only country in the world where you have such a um, sophisticated system. Um, China, the um, Healthy China 2020 support um, program was actually launched around to move um, the rural countries closer towards the urban area and this with the support of internet hospitals. This um, policy has further been enhanced um, about two years ago with the China healthy 2030 strategy, which is now a bit more compartmentalizing um, the strategy from 2020 and actually now trying to move this to the next level with the support. What the internet hospitals are basically um, doing is they are taking lots of different solutions into consideration, let it be an HCP support program, let it be an EHR system, any sort of health management systems, hospital systems whatsoever, as well as the hospitals overall bring them to the cloud to provide certain services. Some of the very known players within that space are, are DXY, for instance, probably one of the pioneers within the space. Um, we Doctor, you're probably all familiar with, and, and Waymai, which is more on the disease management side, but still are forms, forms these internet hospitals out there. Um, what you can then basically do is any service that you are previously received from a physical facility, so a hospital, you can now actually get to your doorstep delivered, or you can get support via telemedicine solutions, um, everything via this internet um, hospital. The ultimate, um, the, the alternate finale would therefore look like you don't have to step a foot into a hospital anymore, which in China, in case you've ever lived there, is the worst thing you can ever do. Uh, trust me, I speak of um, uh, when, when I was living there, I, I had experienced that. Um, so getting your consultation online, then your prescription to your WeChat application, later your medication sent to your doorstep, um, and at the same time, always checking in with your doctor is probably the best thing that can happen um, to the Chinese population and therefore also helps to connect the rural areas again with the urban areas, because um, you always have this huge discrepancy between the services that you can get in the outback somewhere in, in China or whether you live in Beijing, for instance, or in Shanghai. Some of the microeconomic factors. So, um, so I'm just sharing one, one each just to not overload you here with information. And when we look into the partnerships and investment side of it, for instance, here, 
what we can do is we can calculate an investor to venture ratio as well as a partner to, to venture ratio. When we look into China here on the very left hand side, this is actually a very strong factor. When you look into the investor to venture ratio, only the US is actually stronger as compared to uh, China overall. When we exclude China from the equation across Asia Pacific, you're actually seeing that the ratio here is more towards the negative side of it. So we have more ventures than we have actually investors out there. Same as for the partners, China is very strong there as well. We have actually more partnerships than we see ventures in there, which is again, a very strong supporting factor that the ventures that are there are very healthy and are actually open to partnerships also with international companies. We actually see a very strong interest of international companies that we work with to partner with ventures headquartered in China as well. Overall, we've seen there are more than 1,100 partners across China. These are particularly from the, from the biotech and pharmaceutical side followed then by the insurance space here with 30%. So these together are comprising of more than two thirds of all partnerships that we are seeing and followed by other tech companies that it be the Apples of this world, Google's of this world, uh, Google probably not so much, but the Apples of this world, for instance, were then partnering there as well. And then 10% of the partnerships that we are seeing or the partners that we are seeing are coming from the, from the institutional academic uh, or hospital side. Um, another microeconomic con condition probably also to highlight is around the regulatories. Um, we've started capturing the regulatory uh, landscape now for more than 14 countries across the globe. Um, when we're looking into how many ventures are uh, having received regulatory approvals, actually China is, is a very strong country. You have for instance here across the medical diagnostic side, as, as of H1 2021, We've seen four new regulatory approvals happening for four of the Chinese ventures here. These can also be in, in other markets. It doesn't need to be in, in China only. Um, across the patient solutions, we've seen two regulatory approvals. Um, across the population health management side, two of them as well. And remote monitoring, this one, Poctech, um, it's a diabetes type one company that is, um, that is helping also people to cope with it, has, has received um, a one regulatory um, 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 approval uh, during the past year. When we look into where most of the regulatories are getting received, it remains particularly in the medical diagnostics field as far as the patient solutions aside, which ultimately makes sense because these are the two that need to be the most regulated because you are engaging with the patient and therefore it's patient centric and therefore you need to have a regulatory approval in order to launch your product. Okay. So this gives you a bit of a snapshot how China actually looks. So now looking a bit into the investment trends overall. Um, when we look into digital health on a global scale, 10% of the ventures are either headquartered in China or are having operations in China, whereby the ones that are headquartered in China are far exceeding the ones that are that are active within China, which is not a surprise because for you as an international company to actually step in, into China has tons of risks, it's very difficult and you need tons of support. And even if you enter the market as an international startup into, in, into China as a market, you are not the majority shareholder of your own company. Um, when we look into the ones that are currently um, private companies, so not exited and haven't, um, and haven't died off over the past year, uh, over the past years, we're currently looking into 500 plus active ventures um, that are between the early stage and the late stage, but not exited at the moment. Um, the, the increase has slowed down as in any other ecosystem overall. Um, so we need to see what 2021, 2022 now, now might bring in, in terms of how many new ventures are getting incorporated. Traditionally, the 2020 numbers are always a bit lower than expected because it takes a while for a venture to exit its stealth mode, moving into, moving into a more um, open phase so that um, we can also start tracking them actually. And um, when we look into where these ventures are currently located across their, um, across their pipeline, so again, anything that is blue colored here is excluded from the equation here as well. So these are not part of it. When we look into 2020, actually 15%, uh, when we look into 2012 as an incorporation of the venture, more than 15% of these ventures are now actually either exited or they are currently public, uh, publicly listed on any of, of the stock exchanges, which is quite a strong number um, 
is 15% of the number of ventures incorporated there is quite significant. And therefore it shows that there is an exit path for ventures as well in the digital health space coming from China. When you look into 20, uh, 2019 and 2020, most of the ventures are currently in early stage and in series A as expected because they're just starting with their journey. Um, you also have lots of ventures who are currently still unfunded. These are not included in this equation here as well. When we look into the funding, this is what I was mentioning in the beginning. There was this huge dip in funding between Q3 2019 and Q2 2020. This was first the US-China trade war and then later followed by the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, we actually saw the dip a bit earlier and we expected that this is only because of the US-China trade war. Um, but as we progress through Q3, and in case you all recall, I think the first case in Wuhan got announced roughly early November, it kind of made sense that there was this major dip already happening in Q3, because within China, there were rumors of a disease spreading significantly earlier than what us actually reached outside. So it could have been that this already started earlier with the dip here, which we then experienced during while we were addressing the Q3 update in, in 2019, we were like, is there anything happening across China? But we couldn't really say what at this, at this point in, in time. Um, overall, when we look into the value share um, of the global funding, this in 2021 has so far reached um, its lowest. It only represents 11% of the global funding invested. This is particularly driven because uh, the US is just exploding when it comes to funding at the moment. Um, and this is, even though funding is now um, increasing again, um, it still doesn't represent the same strength of what we've seen in previous years because um, it doesn't exceed the previous quarters as much as in the US it, it currently does. Okay, when we look into some of the mega deals, and this is actually interesting. Um, so again, looking into Q3, Q4, Q1, Q2, here 19 and 20, we've seen the lowest number of mega deals ever happening. And then while we entered Q3, Q4, we actually saw it was the most number of mega deals that we've ever seen, which kind of shows you again this, and our investors were kind of waiting for the for the economy to to wake up across China again and start making their investments. And this was quite strong to see or to fear as well in, in Q3 and Q4. And you're actually seeing this also with the total numbers that I just showed you on the chart here before. So Q3 and Q4 actually were the strongest quarters in 2020 that we've ever seen across China. You're seeing what the steep up, no, the steep increase from the Q2 2018 here was. This is a major increase as well. Um, so that's a little bit slow. Ooh. Okay, and now in Q2 2021, we already started seeing again, there were a couple of new mega deals exceeding Q1 again, um, but yet they are significantly smaller in size and therefore are not representing the strongest of what we've seen so far. So these two, two together were actually more funding invested as these four here together. So looking a bit into the therapeutic focus area, always also quite interesting in order to see are the solutions that are getting funded more specialized or are they more general? Um, so when we look into, into, into the funding that floats into it, oncology, 153 million, the neurology, 63 million, pediatrics, 54, uh, 54 million, same as cardio and same as gynecology. Um, when you compare this to 2020, and let's just double these numbers, they're still significantly lower apart from the pediatric side here as compared to what we saw in half of the time during 2020, especially oncology got a major hit during, during this year. We are also seeing that the funding is floating more towards the non-specialized solutions, uh, which then supports again, let's say um, the internet hospital side or the telemedicine side or the online marketplaces side. So things that are currently also required are there because it literally again starts connecting the people versus the solutions that are actually very scientific, rich, and require lots of research um, are currently feeling the pain of not being able to raise as much funding as they necessarily would like, as, as they would like to. Um, apart from gynecology, that is actually quite strong. So 39, when you're taking 58 divided by two, we are actually now exceeding the half of what we've seen in 2020. Um, same as pediatrics also has been quite strong this year, but the traditionally strong therapeutic focus areas, cardio, neuro, and onco have seen a significantly lower funding 
um, as expected also after the very strong 2020 here with $1.29 billion invested, for instance. Let's deep dive into maybe the also the cluster side a bit. Um, when we look into digital health, in case you're following us for a while longer, we came up with a very sophisticated taxonomy currently capturing 58 distinct categories across uh, 17 clusters. Um, when, when you look into these clusters, so this is from a uh, on, a, on, a, on, a, on a cluster point of view, the strongest clusters across China are health management solutions. This is where internet hospitals are also falling under. Medical diagnostics, patient solutions, um, wellness, and health service searches. Again, health service searches is a sub part also of the internet hospital. So certain solutions within these two are the primary care side of the internet hospitals versus the patient solutions could be the could be the adherent side of the internet hospital. So they are all kind of falling under it. But the hospital solutions that are supporting the hospitals directly, these are falling under health management solutions, but also they're also supporting, let's say, pharmacies, as, um, et cetera, as well. Um, okay, so when we're looking into this, actually, these two categories are sharing roughly a third of the entire ventures that we have out there. So medical diagnostics and health um, and health management solutions. When we look into how mature these ventures are, that's again a different score that we are always looking into. Most of the ventures in China are either in the scaling phase or they're in the very promising phase. And when you look into um, how they are centered across their categories, the medical diagnostics ones are often very promising and rising ventures. The health management solutions are very spread out depending on how mature they are, they, they are with the majority of the ventures currently sitting under the scaling phase. But we also have tons of rising stars actually here that are very strong and very strong also supporting uh, you now the ecosystem there as well. When we look into the partnership side, so do we see any certain, um, do we see any certain um, uh, correlations between the categories and the partnerships? Yes, we do. Medical di diagnostics here with 458 partnerships, sharing 21% of the entire partnerships in the past three and a half, three and a half years, four and a half years. Um, we're actually seeing that we have a very, we have many promising ventures sitting here. And this also highlights um, why so many companies are partnering with these digital health ventures, because they are so advanced, these digital health ventures already, that it makes sense to start partnering with them. Similarly, for the health management solutions, we have many ventures that are already sitting on the promising side, so scaling and promising. Hence, we're also seeing um, lots of partnerships happening there as well, uh, which is then followed here by Introtech, for instance, which is not part of the most featured um, solution out there, but we see many, many um, partnerships happening in the space as well. Just to help you understand what are some of these um, partnerships that we are seeing uh, here, for instance, China Jinmao has partnered with more health around a corporate health solution that is that is very um, uh, that is very tech and enabled. Um, Roche and Acorn Met have um, worked together on an on-demand lab test to basically send the Roche uh, lab test straight to the doorstep. Um, straight to the doorstep of a patient. They're taking the samples. The foreign met is then um, looking into analyzing them and the results are getting analyzed, sent back to the patient, to their doorstep or to, to their mobile phone so that they can see, um, so that they can see um, if they are infected with something or not. Minarini here, which is um, an Italian pharma company, has partnered with Janke around both um, an on-demand sending of medication, so more on the adherence side, as well as also on the disease management side, so which is again very, very adherence centric to actually have people track their disease and um, do a certain intervention program to help them cope with, with the disease. Um, some, some other partnerships here with Bygene, again, the pharma company, um, and, and We Doctor, similar, basically looking into adherence programs. And here, this is a hospital partnership together with our Daifu. This is around actually implementing a sophisticated internet hospital solution into the Huashan hospital, um, into the in, in, into Huashan hospital. This can also be some of the partnerships that we are seeing out there. Okay, looking into funding into categories. Um, again, it's not too surprising. Uh, online marketplaces have traditionally been um, the categories that receive the most funding. Um, it kind of features what I was showing you with the specialized um, investments earlier. Online marketplaces are always very, 
um, disease agnostic. So they have no specialized disease of what they are capturing. Um, now during the pandemic, it kind of made sense that people were looking into how can I get my medication even when I'm at home? Um, obviously investors are seeing the similar trends um, and therefore we are seeing that there are there's very strong funding going into it. However, what you see when you look into the number of deals here, it's actually a very low number with only six. That means that the average funding size floating into these ventures is actually very high, showing you that the ventures that are already in the online marketplace space are already very mature. So they're raising a series D, series E, series F funding round. And this is why these numbers are also very high. So whenever you look into the numbers that we're sharing with you, always look into, um, the, the, the correlation between the number of deals and the funding that we are presenting to you. On the other hand, medical diagnostics, for instance, um, you see 16 deals across $152 million invested. It's a very small funding size, showing you that we currently see many early stage ventures currently receiving funding, um, and therefore they are now moving up in the pipeline. And in the, in, in the, in the next few years, we will actually see them also raising um, bigger funding rounds as well. So, so it's always good to understand what's the correlation between these two numbers when we are presenting them as well. Okay, let's do a deep dive. And I have one deep dive for you, which goes into the online marketplaces. So where are these ventures actually all look, look located? So when we look into the 510 active ventures, 6% of them are currently on their marketplaces. Um, where they are located is either in Beijing or it's in Guangdong. So Guangdong, again, it's Guangzhou and Shenzhen, which also makes sense to a certain extent, because um, it has been, those are the two cities, the second and third most populated city when it comes to digital health ventures um, after Beijing. Um, so it makes no, no surprise that in these two um, provinces, we actually have the most uh, ventures also located. Um, how they've been increasing year on year, um, it was very strong increase year on year back between 15 and 16. It kind of has always doubled year on year. And then since then has been falling down uh, similar to what we see overall, because you can't grow exponentially, um, then we would have no ecosystem left to be shared um, amongst. Um, an example here is Miao Show, for instance. It's a very mature consumer marketplace, latest funding around the $460 million with a valuation of close to $3.5, $3.6 billion at the moment. So it's a very mature venture. So when you're looking into, um, let's say, bringing a product straight to the consumer and your pharma company, it would be good to maybe start talking with them because uh, they can potentially help you uh, across 32 major cities in, in China and growing. When we look into how the funding is, is distributed in 2021, most funding actually, and this is what I was showing you earlier, we're going into series D and beyond stages, which is not a surprise because we saw not so many deals, but very high value. And therefore, Series C, Series D makes sense. We only saw one or two deals very, very tiny here in Series A ventures. There was no early stage deal in, in the next, uh, in the past few years, and there was no um, Series B deal happening in 2021 either. Um, when we look into uh, where the funding floats into, similar to the slide before, and that's kind of correlated, and most of the funding in total, 95% are going into both Beijing and Guangdong. Um, so the province again of, of Guangzhou and Shenzhen. Uh, another example here is Xiao Shebang. You, you can check it out um, on your own. Um, I actually have one more slide. Uh, it's currently hidden, um, which was showing you some of the more, um, some of the ventures that have been raising significant funding rounds. However, I've shown a similar slide already earlier. So um, it doesn't, it doesn't really uh, trouble at the moment too, too much, but I would like to open the floor in case you have any questions at the moment. So please use the Q&A section um, and I will be happy to answer uh, the presentation. There floats the question around whether we are sharing these slides um, in the very end of it. Um, and thank you also for Svante for your, for your question. I will answer it soon after. Um, we will not distribute these slides because they are part of, an, um, of, a premium, um, of a premium report. However, we will be sharing the recording of this, uh, of, of, of this event. So you can watch it again and uh, visit the slides again that I've been sharing with you. 
Um, when it comes to international players entering China, when we are looking into large corporates, they are all interested in China as a market because it's still one of the largest ecosystems out there and one of the most important markets also for large pharma or insurance players. Um, there actually, there's actually amongst the insurance players recently um, a stronger push considering that the Chinese government is very friendly at the moment with them. They don't need to necessarily partner with a Chinese company anymore in order to provide with their services. So we do see a strong push coming from Europe, a very strong insurance market to enter, to enter China. I think Allianz was the first insurance company that got, um, that got the license to operate as a standalone entity uh, across China about last year, if I'm not mistaken. Pharma companies have always traditionally been very interested in, in, in China, and we are seeing that there are um, many partnerships happening because uh, China is one of their largest markets and one of the most growing markets because um, people can start affording the, the medication and they're moving forward and they're also moving over to being a self-paying market, uh, a self-paying market to be an insurance market and therefore you can reimburse the, the medications as well. Um, if the companies are profitable yet, it's always hard to say because they are private companies. It's always hard to say whether any of these companies is profitable. But from the information that we see at the moment um, for the ones that are public is um, many of them are actually pr producing black numbers. So they are profitable, um, especially when you look into the online marketplaces um, out there. Uh, like one on one ink, for instance, uh, they are profitable already. And this shows again um, that there's a very strong support for digital health ventures out there to actually also become profitable because they are just being used very, very often. Are there any life examples of ecosystem leaders by insurance apart from Ping An? <sighs> always, always hard to say. Ping, Ping An has built their own little bubble of solutions. Uh, you have the uh, Ping An Good Doctor solution, which now also expanded uh, outside China, for instance. Um, you have many other players, for instance, Song An, who's very strong in the market, but you also see international players like AXA plays a very strong role. Um, Allianz plays a very strong role, and they're all moving into becoming more digitally savvy now. Um, Ping, Ping An started as an as an online broker and moved into the insurance space after. Um, so they kind of build their ecosystem from scratch. What other players are now trying to do is they kind of try to copy the model what Ping An started by either acquiring companies or by uh, start uh, partnering with ventures um, there as well. Um, as a question, are the companies you mentioned, oh, so no, oh, this one I answered, um, this one I answered. What has been and is, in your opinion, the impact of the pandemic on the digital market space in China? Okay, um, multiple things. Um, a, we saw a reconciliation of the market overall. We saw many ventures dying off during the pandemic because they just haven't had funding left. The ones that survived the crisis and that got support because they got um, also the also the support from, from the investors to actually start using their solutions, um, they actually became significantly stronger. Um, from my friends that I still have across China, most of them now know at least five to 10 digital health ventures. If you would have asked them two or three years ago, they would have rather asked you back, what is digital health actually? So um, just the awareness of digital health solutions has grown dramatically, but this is not just something that we see in China, it's something that we see across the entire globe. Um, when, when we started off Galen Growth back in 2015, and we started talking to people and we're trying to teach them what is digital health and that they should start partnering with digital health ventures, the first question that you have to answer them, what is digital health actually? So, um, the, so the pandemic has really shown people how tech can help them also have a more healthy life and to also simplify some of these steps that previously were not um, as simple as they are now with digital health solutions. Can you comment on the mental health DTX solutions in China? What are the barriers? How does the government support some of the examples of success? Um, there's just one venture that I'm very familiar with and I lost the name at the moment. What, what, what they started doing is they've built first a digital solution. They figured out 
just working as a mental health venture digitally does not necessarily work. So what they started doing is they started building clinics across, across China because um, Chinese people were still somewhere um, very traditional. So they still like to see also counselors. So they kind of build an ecosystem that is both online and offline. Um, they've actually now started building one of the largest networks of counselors across the country as well. I forgot what the company is literally called. Um, digital solutions in terms of DTX solutions, it's hard for them to set foot into China at the moment because there is no regulatory process around them at the moment. Um, the MH, no, I think it's the MHRA, which is like the Chinese um, FFDA, um, does currently not regulate these solutions. You do have wellness mental health solutions, but using them as a medical prescription applications is currently, uh, at least I have not seen any mental health solution as a digital therapeutics that that uh, that has been used. There are some of the US players who are trying to um, to step into China, looking into Achille or pair therapeutics. Um, even these have not yet received any regulatory approval, even though there are um, that could be used in the in the in the, in the pediatric side um, at least. But we do see that when it comes to the neurology side, and this is also where where Achille and pair are playing a very strong role in. We do see that there are now early stage ventures that are start um, building solutions, but it's more around the diagnosis of it and not so much of the adherence side of it. Uh, okay, Ooh, there are many questions now. How do you define partnerships? How is it different from paying for a solution created by startups? Okay. Um, there are different ways to see a partnership. You can have a research partnership, you can have a commercial partnership, you can have a strategic partnership, whereby the strategic partnership always looks into a financial support. So if you have Ping An investing in a particular company, you're seeing this as a strategic investment, which doesn't necessarily mean is that they're also partnering with one another. So this doesn't necessarily count as a, as a partnership because just by investing into one doesn't mean that you start working with them. The research partnership is what we often see between, let's say, a hospital and a digital health solution, whereby the partnership is around bringing a certain product further by helping them, let's say, to do their clinical trials together without paying for a certain service as a digital health venture, because they're relying on the hospital to kind of support them in the, in the partnership. Um, Figuring out the difference between a commercial and a strategic partnership is always a bit in the gray zone. So it's always hard to see what it is. A commercial partnership is you're buying a service to, to use it by let's say white labeling a certain product to bring it to your own customers. Let's assume large pharma company goes out there looking into a disease man um, into a diabetes management program. They would whitelist or they could whitelist a certain solution and are then um, using the solution as a, as a B2B2C product um, for, the, for the patients. Often there's also the HCP somewhere involved in there um, where they are paying for the service. When it comes to the strategic partnership, we are more looking into, let's say a venture to venture partnership. Let's assume a Miao Show starts working with a wee doctor. It doesn't need to be that there's any, um, any financial arrangements um, between them, but there's, just trying to work together and build a larger ecosystem all together and therefore trying to uh, launch a new product to, together, for instance. This is usually how we are defining partnerships of the, of the ones that we are seeing out there. How far down the, the list of therapeutic focus areas is mental health in China, considering that mental health, digital health is a common format elsewhere. Um, we will have a report on mental health, I think going out next month. Um, where we are focusing much more on that, if I'm not mistaken. Um, mental health has traditionally had hard time in, in, in Asia. This is particularly because of the issue of people don't really like to talk about mental health solutions. Um, many of the countries are now trying to support the people to actually be more open about it. And actually digital health solutions can have a strong impact on that because you don't necessarily need to see a counselor. You don't necessarily need, need to go outside and tell someone that you have an issue, that you have anxiety, that you have tons of, of stress. Especially the pandemic has, has shown us that the stress on both 
the very young and the elderly is extremely strong because they are the ones that are basically suffering the most from, from the pandemic at the moment. Um, the issue that we see, there are not many ventures at the moment in mental health out there. And if there are, then they're still very, very young. So the funding ones that you see within these ventures across Asia Pacific is still very small. So in terms of value, it's a very, it's a very low amount that we are seeing invested. In terms of volume, it's been increasing. It's not very strong, unfortunately. Literally, investors are also not very savvy and they don't really understand digital health yet. So you don't have these specialized investors that you see in the United States, for instance, who are all very keen on jumping onto the bandwagon to just launch another mental health solution again. Um, here in China, uh, here, here in Asia, and especially also in, in, in China, but in China less, investors are more risk averse. So they don't necessarily like to just throw money into a solution just because it's, it's a hot topic at the moment. Okay, how far, okay, this one I've just answered. Um, my question is, India and China are racing towards be becoming economic superpowers. Where do you see India's position in the digital health uh, industry? I think we will at some point also share in the reports on, on India. It's the second largest ecosystem when it comes to digital health in, um, in Asia Pacific. The issue that we see there is that you have many, many young ventures that are entering the market. You have many angel investors who like to support a venture in the beginning, um, but you don't see many who are exceeding the Series A funding stage, so they will die off along the way. That's a problem that we see in, in India. Um, you can drop me a message. Happy to happy to uh, share a bit more, more insights with you. Since we talk about, about China, I have to talk about China too, today, but happy to also talk about India at some point. Okay. If you're applying blockchain technology around healthcare, what are the regulatory challenges? Um, it's currently hard to say, because um, with all the issues that we are currently seeing on the recent uh, tech crackdown across China, I don't want to make any projections on what's coming next. Um, first, cryptocurrencies have been banned from, from China. Um, you can't export data. This is usually where blockchain is extremely good, because you can apply federated learning. Um, to basically collect data very regionally across China, but apply the code somewhere outside China. So usually this, this could be very supportive, but I don't want to make any predictions at the moment how blockchain technology will further advance digital health um, across China, because particularly because of the recent tech crackdown, and we don't know really um, how much further this, this will go. What is the state of evolution for diagnostics medical imaging solutions? It's it's actually quite a strong one. Um, you may have seen recently E2 Medical has been acquired. So E2 Medical, which is a subsidiary of E2 Technologies, which is particularly around the medical imaging space, has been um, has been acquired by Deepwise. Deepwise has always been a pioneer within that space as well. Deepwise is actually part of the ecosystem around the Sunshine Hospital. And the Sunshine Hospital, again, belongs to the Sunshine Insurance Group. Um, so it's quite a sophisticated ecosystem already because China is so strong when it comes to deep learning, machine learning, NLP, and all of the very sophisticated technologies. Um, we do see that the medical imaging set is, is very advanced. Um, you have tons of these solutions where you can just use your WeChat application and scan, let's say, the mole on, on your skin and it tells you whether it's cancerous or not, similar to what Google has now recently launched with a big Wuha. Um, the Chinese solutions, the, the Chinese ecosystem around the medical imaging analysis, both CT or, or, M, or MRI scans or whatsoever, is a very advanced one. And we now start seeing that Yes, the, that the market is maturing because we start seeing either M&As, uh, m and activities. We see tons of partnerships within that space as well because that belongs to the medical diagnostics side for us um, in our classification. And we do see very large funding rounds. Um, and therefore, it has a very strong supporting factor that medical imaging is a very strong ecosystem out there. Okay, I think I will take one to two more questions today. What are the entry barriers you see for digital health startups in neighboring countries from venturing into China? Um, what I was mentioning in, in the beginning, China is a very, it's a very um, um, nationalistic market. Um, for you as a digital health venture entering China, 
what most of the time require you to partner with a local entity or to assign a local director who ultimately would hold the majority share of, of your Chinese entity. This has always been an issue to many companies. Um, that's why entering the Chinese market is already pretty difficult. As a foreign company in China, you are also often seen as you don't necessarily answer to the needs of the Chinese population. So they would rather work with a Chinese company providing the same solution as to what you are providing just because of the of the, uh, the issue that some of the uh, people have across China with foreign companies out there. Um, the third one is receiving investment from a Chinese company to actually being able to create market share in China is extremely hard. It is difficult for a non-Chinese company to raise funding from a Chinese investor, again, to help them enter the market. There are few accelerators who actually help you. JLabs, for instance, um, the Johnson Johnson in, in Innovation Factory supports ventures also from overseas to start setting up their entity within China and are helping them to expand their market in there as well. There are a few other examples who are, who are supportive on that front as well. Um, yeah, that's particularly the biggest issue from entering the Chinese market. I can't think of anything else at the moment. There are probably many more issues. Okay. Um, what are the impact of healthcare regulations on these companies? How do they overcome these issues? For instance, JD seems to be operating outside of the legal frameworks for prescription medications. Um, since China is now moving forward also with implementing more on a GDPR-like level, we probably also at some point start seeing a crackdown on that. Um, most of the other huge platforms have been already slammed with any sort of sanctions. I think I've read an article yesterday about that the Chinese government uh, is not uh, doesn't think about stopping of what they're currently doing. So we may start seeing that there's a further crackdown also on platforms like, like JD, for instance. How many of these companies in China also extend their services to other countries? Good question, always love it. Um, not many is the answer. When it comes to diagnostic solutions, yes. Um, we do see that they're expanding particularly into Europe. As for a Chinese company entering Europe is significantly easier than entering the United States. Various reasons behind that. Um, we also start seeing that, uh, that ventures like uh, take Ping on Good Doctor. So Good Doctor as an entity, as a as an as a um, as an example, they've also ventured into Indonesia. Actually, very strong there, um, due to their investment that they've done into Grab a few years ago. I'm not mis mistaken, where they are now providing services via the Grab application in Indonesia, also to the general population to provide um, insurance services for these ventures to uh, venture into other countries that are more averse China. Um, it's harder to to enter, but diagnostic solutions or anything that is supporting the hospital side is generally very um, attractive also to countries outside as well. Good, I think I've now answered all of the questions in case I have not seen any. Uh, as I was saying in the beginning, please feel free to drop me a message as well. Um, I try to answer as many as I can. Um, but with this, I would like to thank you all for your attendance today and the many, many questions that I had to answer. It's always good to have a more open dis discussion as well. So with this, I would like to thank you all for joining me today and hope to see you next time at any of our presentations. Thank you.